Part two of Story fifteen of Dubliners. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Dead. The piercing morning air came into the hall where they were standing, so that Aunt Kate said, Close the door, somebody. Mrs. Mallins will get her death of cold. Mr. Brown is out there, Aunt Kate, said Mary Jane. Brown is everywhere, said Aunt Kate, lowering her voice. Mary Jane laughed at her tone. Really, she said archly, he is very attentive. He has been laid on here like the gas, said Aunt Kate in the same tone, all during the Christmas. She laughed herself this time good-humouredly, and then added quickly, But tell him to come in, Mary Jane, and close the door. I hope to goodness he didn't hear me. At that moment the hall door was opened, and Mr. Brown came in from the doorstep, laughing as if his heart would break. He was dressed in a long green overcoat with mock astrakhan cuffs and collar, and wore on his head an oval fur cap. He pointed down the snow-covered quay, from where the sound of shrill, prolonged whistling was borne in. "'Teddy will have all the cabs in Dublin out,' he said. Gabriel advanced from the little pantry behind the office, struggling into his overcoat, and, looking round the hall, said, "'Greta not down yet?' "'She's getting on her things, Gabriel.' said Aunt Kate. "'Who's playing up there?' asked Gabriel. "'Nobody. They're all gone.' "'Oh, no, Aunt Kate,' said Mary Jane. "'Bartell Darcy and Miss O'Callaghan aren't gone yet.' "'Someone is fooling at the piano anyhow,' said Gabriel. Mary Jane glanced at Gabriel and Mr. Brown and said with a shiver, "'It makes me feel cold to look at you two gentlemen muffled up like that. I wouldn't like to face your journey home at this hour.' "'I'd like nothing better this minute.' said Mr. Brown stoutly, than a rattling fine walk in the country or a fast drive with a good spanking goer between the shafts. We used to have a very good horse and trap at home, said Aunt Julia sadly. The never-to-be-forgotten Johnny, said Mary Jane laughing. Aunt Kate and Gabriel laughed too. Why, what was wonderful about Johnny? asked Mr. Brown. The late lamented Patrick Morkin, our grandfather, that is, explained Gabriel, commonly known in his later years as the old gentleman, was a glue-boiler. "'Oh, now, Gabriel,' said Aunt Kate, laughing, "'he had a starch-mill.' "'Well, glue or starch,' said Gabriel, "'the old gentleman had a horse by the name of Johnny, and Johnny used to work in the old gentleman's mill, walking round and round in order to drive the mill. That was all very well. But now comes the tragic part about Johnny.' One fine day the old gentleman thought he'd like to drive out with the quality to a military review in the park. "'The Lord have mercy on his soul,' said Aunt Kate compassionately. "'Amen,' said Gabriel. So the old gentleman, as I said, harnessed Johnny and put on his very best tall hat and his very best stock collar and drove out in grand style from his ancestral mansion, somewhere near Back Lane, I think. Everyone laughed, even Mrs. Mallins, at Gabriel's manner, and Aunt Kate said, Oh, now, Gabriel, he didn't live in Back Lane, really. Only the mill was there. Out from the mansion of his forefathers, continued Gabriel, he drove with Johnny, and everything went on beautifully until Johnny came in sight of King Billy's statue. And whether he fell in love with the horse King Billy sits on, or whether he thought he was back again in the mill, anyhow, he began to walk round the statue. Gabriel paced in a circle round the hall, in his galoshes, amid the laughter of the others. "'Round and round he went,' said Gabriel, and the old gentleman, who was a very pompous old gentleman, was highly indignant. "'Go on, sir. What do you mean, sir? Johnny, Johnny, most extraordinary conduct. Can't understand the horse.' The peal of laughter which followed Gabriel's imitation of the incident was interrupted by a resounding knock at the hall door. Mary Jane ran to open it and let in Freddy Mallins. Freddy Mallins, with his hat well back on his head, and his shoulders humped with cold, was puffing and streaming after his exertions. "'Oh, I could only get one cab,' he said. "'Oh, we'll find another along the quay,' said Gabriel. "'Yes,' said Aunt Kate. "'Better not keep Mrs. Mallins standing in the draught. Mrs. Mallins was helped down the front steps by her son and Mr. Brown, and after many manoeuvres hoisted into the cab. Freddy Mallins clambered in after her and spent a long time settling her on the seat. Mr. Brown helping him with advice. At last she was settled comfortably and Freddy Mallins invited Mr. Brown into the cab. There was a good deal of confused talk and then Mr. Brown got into the cab. 
The cabman settled his rug over his knees and bent down for the address. The confusion grew greater and the cabman was directed differently by Freddy Mallins and Mr. Brown, each of whom had his head out through a window of the cab. The difficulty was to know where to drop Mr. Brown along the route, and Aunt Kate, Aunt Julia and Mary Jane helped the discussion from the doorstep with cross directions and contradictions and abundance of laughter. As for Freddy Mallins, he was speechless with laughter. He popped his head in and out of the window every moment to the great danger of his hat, and told his mother how the discussion was progressing, till at last Mr. Brown shouted to the bewildered cabman above the din of everybody's laughter, "'Do you know Trinity College?' "'Yes, sir,' said the cabman. "'Well, drive bang up against Trinity College gates,' said Mr. Brown, "'and then we'll tell you where to go. You understand now?' "'Yes, sir,' said the cabman. "'Make like a board for Trinity College.' "'Right, sir,' said the cabman. The horse was whipped up and the cab rattled off along the quay amid a chorus of laughter and adieus. Gabriel had not gone to the door with the others. He was in a dark part of the hall, gazing up the staircase. A woman was standing near the top of the first flight, in the shadow also. He could not see her face, but he could see the terracotta and salmon-pink panels of her skirt which the shadow made appear black and white. It was his wife. She was leaning on the banisters, listening to something. Gabriel was surprised at her stillness and strained his ear to listen also, but he could hear little save the noise of laughter and dispute on the front steps, a few chords struck on the piano, and a few notes of a man's voice, singing. He stood still in the gloom of the hall, trying to catch the air that the voice was singing, and gazing up at his wife. There was grace and mystery in her attitude, as if she were a symbol of something. He asked himself what is a woman standing on the stairs in the shadow, listening to distant music, a symbol of. If he were a painter, he would paint her in that attitude. Her blue felt hat would show off the bronze of her hair against the darkness, and the dark panels of her skirt would show off the light ones. Distant music, he would call the picture, if he were a painter. The hall door closed and Aunt Kate, Aunt Julia and Mary Jane came down the hall, still laughing. "'Well, isn't Freddy terrible?' said Mary Jane. "'He's really terrible.' Gabriel said nothing but pointed up the stairs towards where his wife was standing. Now that the hall door was closed, the voice on the piano could be heard more clearly. Gabriel held up his hand for them to be silent. The song seemed to be in the old Irish tonality and the singer seemed uncertain both of his words and of his voice. The voice, made plaintive by distance and the singer's hoarseness, faintly illuminated the cadence of the air with words expressing grief. O oh, the rain falls on my heavy locks and the dew wets my skin. My babe lies cold. Oh! exclaimed Mary Jane. It's Bartell Darcy singing, and he wouldn't sing all night. Oh, I'll get him to sing a song before he goes. Oh, do, Mary Jane said Aunt Kate. Mary Jane brushed past the others and ran to the staircase, but before she reached it the singing stopped and the piano was closed abruptly. "'Oh, what a pity!' she cried. "'Is he coming down, Greta?' Gabriel heard his wife answer yes and saw her come down towards them. A few steps behind her were Mr. Bartell Darcy and Miss O'Callaghan. "'Oh, Mr. Darcy!' cried Mary Jane. "'It's downright mean of you to break off like that.' when we were all in raptures listening to you. "'I have been at him all the evening,' said Miss O'Callaghan, "'and Mrs. Conroy, too, and he told us he had a dreadful cold and couldn't sing.' "'Oh, Mr. Darcy,' said Aunt Kate, "'now that was a great fib to tell.' "'Can't you see that I'm as hoarse as a crow?' said Mr. Darcy roughly. He went into the pantry hastily and put on his overcoat. The others, taken aback by his rude speech, could find nothing to say. Aunt Kate wrinkled her brows and made signs to the others to drop the subject. Mr. Darcy stood swathing his neck carefully and frowning. "'It's the weather,' said Aunt Julia after a pause. "'Yes, everybody has colds,' said Aunt Kate readily. "'Everybody.' "'They say,' said Mary Jane, "'we haven't had snow like it for thirty years, and I read this morning in the newspapers that the snow is general all over Ireland.' "'I love the look of snow.' said Aunt Julia sadly. "'So do I,' said Miss O'Callaghan. "'I think Christmas is never really Christmas unless we have the snow on the ground.' 
but poor Mr. Darcy doesn't like the snow, said Aunt Kate, smiling. Mr. Darcy came from the pantry, fully swathed and buttoned, and in a repentant tone told them the history of his cold. Everyone gave him advice and said it was a great pity and urged him to be very careful of his throat in the night air. Gabriel watched his wife, who did not join in the conversation. She was standing right under the dusty fanlight, and the flame of gas lit up the rich bronze of her hair which he had seen her drying at the fire a few days before. She was in the same attitude and seemed unaware of the talk about her. At last she turned towards them and Gabriel saw that there was colour on her cheeks and that her eyes were shining. A sudden tide of joy went leaping out of his heart. Mr. Darcy, she said, what is the name of that song you were singing? It's called The Lass of Ockram, said Mr. Darcy, but I couldn't remember it properly. Why, do you know it? The Lass of Ockram, she repeated. I couldn't think of the name. It's a very nice air, said Mary Jane. I'm sorry you are not in voice tonight. Now, Mary Jane, said Aunt Kate, don't annoy Mr. Darcy. I won't have him annoyed. Seeing that all were ready to start, she shepherded them to the door, where good night was said. Well, good night, Aunt Kate, and thanks for the pleasant evening. Good night, Gabriel. Good night, Greta. Good night, Aunt Kate. And thanks ever so much. Good night, Aunt Julia. Oh, good night, Greta. I didn't see you. Good night, Mr. Darcy. Good night, Miss O'Callaghan. Good night, Miss Morkan. Good night again. Good night, all. Safe home. Good night. Good night. The morning was still dark. A dull yellow light brooded over the houses and the river, and the sky seemed to be descending. It was slushy underfoot and only streaks and patches of snow lay on the roofs, on the parapets of the quay, and on the area railings. The lamps were still burning redly in the murky air, and across the river the palace of the forecourts stood out menacingly against the heavy sky. She was walking on before him with Mr. Bartell Darcy, her shoes in a brown parcel tucked under one arm, and her hands holding up her skirt from the slush. She had no longer any grace of attitude but Gabriel's eyes were still bright with happiness. The blood went bounding along his veins, and the thoughts went rioting through his brain, proud, joyful, tender, valorous. She was walking on before him so lightly and so erect that he longed to run after her noiselessly, catch her by the shoulders and say something foolish and affectionate into her ear. She seemed to him so frail that he longed to defend her against something and then to be alone with her. Moments of their secret life together burst like stars upon his memory. A heliotrope envelope was lying beside his breakfast cup, and he was caressing it with his hand. Birds were twittering in the ivy, and the sunny web of the curtain was shimmering along the floor. He could not eat for happiness. They were standing on the crowded platform, and he was placing a ticket inside the warm palm of her glove. He was standing with her in the cold looking in through a grated window at a man making bottles in a roaring furnace. It was very cold. Her face, fragrant in the cold air, was quite close to his, and suddenly he called out to the man at the furnace, "'Is the fire hot, sir?' But the man could not hear with the noise of the furnace. It was just as well. He might have answered rudely. A wave of yet more tender joy escaped from his heart and went coursing in warm blood along his arteries. Like the tender fire of stars, moments of their life together that no one knew of, or would ever know of, broke upon and illumined his memory. He longed to recall to her those moments, to make her forget the years of their dull existence together and remember only their moments of ecstasy. For the years, he felt, had not quenched his soul or hers. Their children, his writing, her household cares had not quenched all their soul's tender fire. In one letter that he had written to her then he had said, Why is it that words like these seem to me so dull and cold? Is it because there is no word tender enough to be your name? Like distant music these words that he had written years before were born towards him from the past. He longed to be alone with her. When the others had gone away, when he and she were in the room in their hotel, then they would be alone together. He would call her softly. Greta. Perhaps she would not hear at once. She would be undressing. 
Then something in his voice would strike her. She would turn and look at him. At the corner of Wine Tavern Street they met a cab. He was glad of its rattling noise, as it saved him from conversation. She was looking out of the window and seemed tired. The other spoke only a few words, pointing out some building or street. The horse galloped along wearily under the murky morning sky, dragging his old rattling box after his heels, and Gabriel was again in a cab with her, galloping to catch the boat, galloping to their honeymoon. As the cab drove across O'Connell Bridge, Miss O'Callaghan said, They say you never cross O'Connell Bridge without seeing a white horse. I see a white man this time, said Gabriel. Where? asked Mr. Bartell Darcy. Gabriel pointed to the statue on which lay patches of snow. Then he nodded familiarly to it and waved his hand. Good night, Dan, he said gaily. When the cab drew up before the hotel, Gabriel jumped out and, in spite of Mr. Bartell Darcy's protest, paid the driver. He gave the man a shilling over his fare. The man saluted and said, A prosperous new year to you, sir. The same to you, said Gabriel cordially. She leaned for a moment on his arm in getting out of the cab and while standing at the curbstone, bidding the others good night. She leaned lightly on his arm, as lightly as when she had danced with him a few hours before. He had felt proud and happy then, happy that she was his, proud of her grace and wifely carriage. But now, after the kindling again of so many memories, the first touch of her body, musical and strange and perfumed, sent through him a keen pang of lust. Under cover of her silence he pressed her arm closely to his side, and, as they stood at the hotel door, he felt that they had escaped from their lives and duties, escaped from home and friends and run away together with wild and radiant hearts to a new adventure. An old man was dozing in a great hooded chair in the hall. He lit a candle in the office and went before them to the stairs. They followed him in silence, their feet falling in soft thuds on the thickly carpeted stairs. She mounted the stairs behind the porter, her head bowed in the ascent, her frail shoulders curved as with a burden, her skirt girt tightly about her. He could have flung his arms about her hips and held her still, for his arms were trembling with desire to seize her, and only the stress of his nails against the palms of his hands held the wild impulse of his body in check. The porter halted on the stairs to settle his guttering candle. They halted, too, on the steps below him. In the silence Gabriel could hear the falling of the molten wax into the tray and the thumping of his own heart against his ribs. The porter led them along a corridor and opened a door. Then he set his unstable candle down on a toilet table and asked at what hour they were to be called in the morning. Eight, said Gabriel. The porter pointed to the tap of the electric light and began a muttered apology, but Gabriel cut him short. We don't want any light. We have light enough from the street. And I say, he added, pointing to the candle, you might remove that handsome article like a good man. The porter took up his candle again, but slowly, for he was surprised by such a novel idea. Then he mumbled good night and went out. Gabriel shot the lock too. A ghostly light from the street lamp lay in a long shaft from one window to the door. Gabriel threw his overcoat and hat on a couch and crossed the room towards the window. He looked down into the street in order that his emotion might calm a little. Then he turned and leaned against the chest of drawers, with his back to the light. She had taken off her hat and cloak, and was standing before a large swinging mirror unhooking her waist. Gabriel paused for a few moments watching her, and then said, Greta. She turned away from the mirror slowly and walked along the shaft of light towards him. Her face looked so serious and weary that the words would not pass Gabriel's lips. No. It was not the moment yet. You look tired, he said. I am a little, she answered. You don't feel ill or weak? No, tired, that's all. She went on to the window and stood there looking out. Gabriel waited again and then, fearing that diffidence was about to conquer him, he said abruptly, By the way, Greta. What is it? You know that poor fellow Malance, he said quickly. Yes. What about him? Well, poor fellow, he's a decent sort of chap after all. 
continued Gabriel in a false voice. He gave me back that sovereign I lent him, and I didn't expect it, really. It's a pity he wouldn't keep away from that brown, because he's not a bad fellow, really. He was trembling now with annoyance. Why did she seem so abstracted? He did not know how he could begin. Was she annoyed, too, about something? If she would only turn to him or come to him of her own accord, to take her as she was would be brutal. No, he must see some ardour in her eyes first. He longed to be master of her strange mood. When did you lend him the pound? she asked after a pause. Gabriel strove to restrain himself from breaking out into brutal language about the Stottish Malins and his pound. He longed to cry to her from his soul, to crush her body against his, to overmaster her. But he said, Oh, at Christmas when he opened that little Christmas card shop in Henry Street. He was in such a fever of rage and desire that he did not hear her come from the window. She stood before him for an instant, looking at him strangely, then suddenly raising herself on tiptoe and resting her hands lightly on his shoulders. She kissed him. You are a very generous person, Gabriel, she said. Gabriel, trembling with delight at her sudden kiss and at the quaintness of her phrase, put his hands on her hair and began smoothing it back, scarcely touching it with his fingers. The washing had made it fine and brilliant. His heart was brimming over with happiness. Just when he was wishing for it she had come to him of her own accord. Perhaps her thoughts had been running with his. Perhaps she had felt the impetuous desire that was in him, and then the yielding mood had come upon her. Now that she had fallen to him so easily he wondered why he had been so diffident. He stood holding her head between his hands. Then, slipping one arm swiftly about her body and drawing her towards him, he said softly, "'Greta, dear, what are you thinking about?' She did not answer or yield wholly to his arm. He said again softly, "'Tell me what it is, Greta. I think I know what is the matter. Do I know?' She did not answer at once. Then she said, in an outburst of tears, "'Oh, I'm thinking about that song, The Lass of Ockram. She broke loose from him and ran to the bed, and, throwing her arms across the bed-rail, hid her face. Gabriel stood stock-still for a moment in astonishment and then followed her. As he passed in the way of the cheval glass he caught sight of himself in full length, his broad, well-filled shirt-front, the face whose expression always puzzled him when he saw it in a mirror, and his glimmering, gilt-rimmed eyeglasses. He halted a few paces from her and said, "'What about the song?' Why does that make you cry?" She raised her head from her arms and dried her eyes with the back of her hand like a child. A kinder note than he had intended went into his voice. "'Why, Greta?' he asked. "'I am thinking about a person long ago who used to sing that song.' "'And who was the person long ago?' asked Gabriel, smiling. "'It was a person I used to know in Galway when I was living with my grandmother,' she said. The smile passed away from Gabriel's face. A dull anger began to gather again at the back of his mind, and the dull fires of his lust began to glow angrily in his veins. "'Someone you were in love with?' he asked ironically. "'It was a young boy I used to know,' she answered, named Michael Fury. He used to sing that song, The Lass of Ockram. He was very delicate.' Gabriel was silent. He did not wish her to think that he was interested in this delicate boy. "'I can see him so plainly.' she said after a moment. Such eyes as he had, big, dark eyes, and such an expression in them, an expression. Oh, then you were in love with him, said Gabriel. I used to go out walking with him, she said, when I was in Galway. A thought flew across Gabriel's mind. Perhaps that was why you wanted to go to Galway with that Ivers girl, he said coldly. She looked at him and asked in surprise, What for? Her eyes made Gabriel feel awkward. He shrugged his shoulders and said, "'How do I know? To see him, perhaps?' She looked away from him along the shaft of light towards the window, in silence. "'He is dead,' she said at length. "'He died when he was only seventeen. Isn't it a terrible thing to die so young as that?' "'What was he?' asked Gabriel, still ironically. "'He was in the gasworks,' she said. Gabriel felt humiliated by the failure of his irony and by the evocation of this figure from the dead, a boy in the gasworks. 
while he had been full of memories of their secret life together, full of tenderness and joy and desire, she had been comparing him in her mind with another. A shameful consciousness of his own person assailed him. He saw himself as a ludicrous figure, acting as a penny-boy for his aunts, a nervous, well-meaning sentimentalist, orating to vulgarians and idealizing his own clownish lusts, the pitiable, fatuous fellow he had caught a glimpse of in the mirror. Instinctively he turned his back more to the light, lest she might see the shame that burned upon his forehead. He tried to keep up his tone of cold interrogation, but his voice when he spoke was humble and indifferent. "'I suppose you were in love with this Michael Fury, Greta,' he said. "'I was great with him at that time,' she said. Her voice was veiled and sad. Gabriel, feeling now how vain it would be to try to lead her whither he had proposed, caressed one of her hands and said, also sadly, "'And what did he die of so young, Greta? Consumption, was it?' "'I think he died for me,' she answered. A vague terror seized Gabriel at this answer, as if, at that hour when he had hoped to triumph, some impalpable and vindictive being was coming against him gathering forces against him in its vague world. But he shook himself free of it with an effort of reason and continued to caress her hand. He did not question her again, for he felt that she would tell him of herself. Her hand was warm and moist. It did not respond to his touch, but he continued to caress it just as he had caressed her first letter to him that spring morning. "'It was in the winter,' she said about the beginning of the winter when I was going to leave my grandmother's and come up here to the convent, and he was ill at the time in his lodgings in Galway and wouldn't be let out, and his people in Uchterard were written to. He was in a decline, they said, or something like that. I never knew rightly. She paused for a moment and sighed. Poor fellow, she said. He was very fond of me, and he was such a gentle boy. We used to go out together walking, you know, Gabriel, like the way they do in the country. He was going to study singing only for his health. He had a very good voice, poor Michael Fury. Well, and then? asked Gabriel. And then, when it came to the time for me to leave Galway and come up to the convent, he was much worse and I wouldn't be let see him. So I wrote him a letter saying I was going up to Dublin and would be back in the summer and hoping he would be better then. She paused for a moment to get her voice under control and then went on. Then... The night before I left I was in my grandmother's house in Nuns Island packing up and I heard gravel thrown up against the window. The window was so wet I couldn't see, so I ran downstairs as I was and slipped out the back into the garden and there was the poor fellow at the end of the garden shivering. And did you not tell him to go back? asked Gabriel. I implored of him to go home at once and told him he would get his death in the rain, but he said he did not want to live. I can see his eyes as well as well. He was standing at the end of the wall where there was a tree. And did he go home? asked Gabriel. Yes, he went home. And when I was only a week in the convent he died and was buried in Uchterard, where his people came from. Oh, the day I heard that, that he was dead. She stopped, choking with sobs, and overcome by emotion flung herself face downward on the bed, sobbing on the quilt. Gabriel held her hand for a moment longer, irresolutely, and then, shy of intruding on her grief, let it fall gently and walked quietly to the window. She was fast asleep. Gabriel, leaning on his elbow, looked for a few moments unresentfully on her tangled hair and half-open mouth, listening to her deep-drawn breath. So she had had that romance in her life. A man had died for her sake. It hardly pained him now to think how poor a part he, her husband, had played in her life. He watched her while she slept, as though he and she had never lived together as man and wife. His curious eyes rested long upon her face and on her hair, and as he thought of what she must have been then, in that time of her first girlish beauty, a strange friendly pity for her entered his soul. He did not like to say, even to himself, that her face was no longer beautiful but he knew that it was no longer the face for which Michael Fury had braved death. Perhaps she had not told him all the story. His eyes moved to the chair over which she had thrown some of her clothes. A petticoat string dangled to the floor. One boot stood upright, 
its limp upper fallen down. The fellow of it lay upon its side. He wondered at his riot of emotions of an hour before. From what had it proceeded? From his aunt's supper, from his own foolish speech, from the wine and dancing, the merrymaking when saying good night in the hall, the pleasure of the walk along the river in the snow. Poor Aunt Julia! She too would soon be a shade with the shade of Patrick Morkin and his horse. He had caught that haggard look upon her face for a moment when she was singing Arrayed for the Bridal. Soon, perhaps, he would be sitting in that same drawing-room, dressed in black, his silk hat on his knees. The blinds would be drawn down and Aunt Kate would be sitting beside him, crying and blowing her nose and telling him how Julia had died. He would cast about in his mind for some words that might console her, and would find only lame and useless ones. Yes, yes, that would happen very soon. The air of the room chilled his shoulders. He stretched himself cautiously along under the sheets and lay down beside his wife. One by one they were all becoming shades. Better pass boldly into that other world, in the full glory of some passion, than fade and wither dismally with age. He thought of how she who lay beside him had locked in her heart for so many years that image of her lover's eyes when he had told her that he did not wish to live. Generous tears filled Gabriel's eyes. He had never felt like that himself towards any woman, but he knew that such a feeling must be love. The tears gathered more thickly in his eyes, and in the partial darkness he imagined he saw the form of a young man standing under a dripping tree. Other forms were near. His soul had approached that region where dwell the vast hosts of the dead. He was conscious of, but could not apprehend, their wayward and flickering existence. His own identity was fading out into a grey, impalpable world. The solid world itself, which these dead had one time reared and lived in, was dissolving and dwindling. A few light taps upon the pane made him turn to the window. It had begun to snow again. He watched sleepily the flakes, silver and dark, falling obliquely against the lamplight. The time had come for him to set out on his journey westward. Yes, the newspapers were right. Snow was general all over Ireland. It was falling on every part of the dark central plain, on the treeless hills, falling softly upon the bog of Allen, and, farther westward, falling softly into the dark mutinous Shannon waves. It was falling, too, upon every part of the lonely churchyard on the hill where Michael Fury lay buried. It lay thickly drifted on the crooked crosses and headstones, on the spears of the little gate, on the barren thorns. His soul swooned slowly as he heard the snow falling faintly through the universe, and faintly falling, like the descent of their last end, upon all the living and the dead. End of Part 2 of Story 15 The Dead Recording by Tighe Hines that is the end of Dubliners by James Joyce.